Okay, so we're going to switch for English, okay? Yeah, cool. Uh, so we, Jerry's going to talk about manufacturing 101, and I'll let you introduce yourself and go ahead. Bonsoir. Je souhaitais faire la présentation en français, mais un, mon niveau de français n'est pas là, encore, pas encore. Deux, si vous allez en Chine, à Taiwan, pour faire la manufacturing, il faut que vous il vous faut parler uh, uh, anglais. So we're going to use English and uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any question. So I didn't have my, so a little bit of introduction of myself. I have always been in, uh, I was an IC designer my whole career for more than 12 years. So I started, when I first started designing IC, it was in 1997, I was using uh, 0.6 micron process. And when I left uh, Silicon Valley in 2012 to come to France, uh, I was using, at Qualcomm, I was using a point 20, uh, no, 28 nanometer process. So basically I have witnessed the entire uh, 15 years or like 20 years of like uh, you know, enormous improvement in SOCs. That's part of the reason why you will be you are able to do the uh, designs right now without knowing all the details. And uh, during the 12-year career, I have created I created a, a startup in 2004, designing HDMI chips. I was among the first three companies in the world to design HDMI chips. Four years later, I sold the company to the public uh, company, and I moved to California. So why did I come to France? Because the uh, food in California sucked. Uh, uh, is this one? Okay. It's okay, I'll skip the, uh, because the original version was very long. So I'll skip the, uh, we're just going to jump right into, uh, like most of the people here, you're, you have a project, you have a startup, you created something, semi prototype, prototype, you want to go into manufacturing. So I have my prototype working, my Kickstarter order is in hand and money in the bank, maybe, maybe in the bank. So what's the problem here? So we have our friend Federic here. I don't know if Federic is today here at UZ.io. So most of the hardware entrepreneurs, when they first started, they're only familiar with the scenes in their own comfort zone. Maybe you're a software engineer, maybe you're a hardware engineer, you're a mechanical engineer. You're familiar with the scene you do, you see some hope, and you went now to, 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 to create your own project. But you only know one domain, uh, you only have one domain knowledge. So you're lacking something that you don't have the, what we call the global view of uh, what it takes to bring the product to the end. And some people feel, I mean, Alibaba, Alibaba is wonderful. If you live in China and, and, and you, you do Alibaba, you do any kind of search, you can find almost anything. But a search on Alibaba will give you like 100 country manufacturers. Uh, so what you do, I'll just send them my RFQ, request for quotes. Of course not. So our friend at Scarmeter told, told us that basically it tells you that we find that if you're going you're gonna to end up with hundreds of factories that are likely not qualified. And we'll talk about what does it mean by qualified. So OK, OK, fine. I'll fight to Sendrin. I got our uh, hero, heroic friend, uh, Steve. They flew all the way to Sendrin to find a friend there. And maybe we'll just solve the problem. Uh, OK, this is our friend Tai Chen. Tai Chen was the uh, CEO president of Foxconn. Uh, FIH, FIH is the largest group under Foxconn, basically in the manufacturer for all the smartphones and everything. So Apple, you name it, Samsung, you name it. So he, he's now retired, he's our good friend, and uh, he's right now flying in China and Taiwan doing a lot of consulting jobs and basically creating the groups. So Terry said that when Pebble, so everyone here knows Pebble, right? Pebble raised, uh, in the background, they raised 10 million in their first Kickstarter campaign, 10 million. And Pedro, the founder, flew to Shenzhen uh, the first year. They flew, he flew there like six times in 2012. Nobody took them seriously. So there's always, uh, uh, for example, you go there and say, look, this is our money, and please manufacture for us. It's not going to happen because it's, there's a lot of barriers and it's, there's a lot of lack of trust. But I have an engineer on my team that speaks Mandarin. <laughs> Convenient, right? I mean, that's how. That's why you hire a Chinese engineer or a Chinese engineer. Okay, this is our friend Jerry Yen. Okay, by the way, I'm not a Jerry Yen who created Yahoo. Otherwise, I won't be standing here. You'll be paying to listen to me to talk. Okay, so I uh, I created my own startup in 2004. Uh, back then, already the whole trend of like you build when you design a chip, you have to design a total solution for your customer. So we are very closely con connected to all the manufacturers and and all the end clients. So even for startups from Taiwan who speak the same language, uh, Mandarin, and who read and write Mandarin, uh, Chinese, 
uh, with the same similar culture, it go to the center, it still gets screwed. It get burned all the time, and see the fire burning. I'm not trying to scare you, but that's basically the question you have to you have to solve. Okay, so there are so many country manufacturers that will jump jump from one uh, to the other, as I wish. Our friend Ben Einstein of uh, both partners said that basically uh, uh, relationship with the country manufacturer is like marriage. I mean, it probably lasts longer than marriage, maybe today. Sometimes today, I think marriage doesn't last four or five years. And you have to really see that it's not just about contract, it's about like mutual trust and our relationship and to get it down. Okay, we had to check. This is just one, just one example. So just take IP cam. So IP cam is the security camera today that's connected to internet. In the old days, it was connected through a, a cable, or today it's through Wi-Fi or whatever. Like drop cam is the perfect example. Just IP cam alone, there are more than a thousand IP cam country manufacturers in Shenzhen. And many of them make profit in addition to the contract with you. They make profit from component sourcing. What does it mean? It means that they will do a lot of trading. They will buy, they will take your design, and they will go to the, the chip providers and saying that, look, I have one million orders. Give me this price. But actually, you don't. He doesn't. He doesn't. He's using your contract to go there and negotiate for a better price. And you turn around and sell part of those chips to the other people. OK? And, uh, Supply kickback. So today this is less because the margin is so low, but you still have broker problems where brokers are taking money, making money in different ways, and you have to factor that into account in addition to the original con manufacturing contract. Some more horror stories. White label products with the same design appeared on Taobao. Do you know, everyone here know Taobao? Taobao is the largest online uh, marketplace in China run by uh, Alibaba. So when, you, when we say Alibaba, actually you're talking about Taobao. You can find almost anything there. So it, your design appear, your product appear on Taobao before they even deliver your product to you because they copy it and they ship it to Taobao. And manufacturers refuse to return the molds. So the molds is the one you use to create your uh, plastic box or whatever. So they refuse to return the molds when you terminate the contract. So this might not sound uh, uh, like, for, for many of you here, you might not know what it means. So most is the single most expensive thing, fixed cost you're going to pay when you first you started your, uh, start your uh, manufacturing. So you, you spend a lot of money building a mold that will create a box for you, you know, the, the shielding for you. But you don't like the country manufacturer anymore. You don't like the plastic injection country manufacturer anymore. You want to switch. And you told them, let's call off the country. According to the country, I can do this. And the next thing you know, you don't know where your mold is. You ask them to return it to you. You say, oh, come, come look for it. It's not there. <laughs> OK, this happens. There are actually some uh, law firms that specialize in doing this. But again, country wouldn't, wouldn't help you. Uh, if it's somewhere in Dongguan, it's, you're not going to find it. OK, so your relationship with the country manufacturers is not about the contract. It's about the, the people. So it's very common, like, for example, we, in Huawei Club, I, I, I go to Central Dongguan very often. I will spend two hours in a factory, but not totally in the factory. I will sit down first. The first hour, we will be drinking tea. Just drinking tea, chatting about, I'm sorry, weather, women, and all kinds of subjects, and build relationship, and understanding the other side's motivation. Well, obviously, you have to speak Mandarin. And then the next hour, maybe you tour around uh, the, the, the factory, and they will offer to take you to lunch, because if you, if you refuse, then that's the best thing. So you have to spend like an entire morning dealing with just one country manufacturer. But that's important, because you have to build trust. For them, it's the same thing, because you can show him the, the Kickstarter page, but he wouldn't know. They wouldn't know if you have the money to pay them or not. So it's a mutual trust. You have to build that. So the ideal country manufacturer for all the new generation of hardware startups, number one, it has to be trustworthy. Also, how do you get that trustworthy part down? I mean, it, that's the biggest problem. Like I say, even if you speak Mandarin, you don't know the ecosystem. You go there, you get screwed. So again, very heroic what Steve and his friend did at Smokio. And capability and quality. This one is actually quite easy to solve. Once you find a trustworthy country manufacturer, if you're willing to pay, you'll get the quality. Again, a lot of things has to do with the, for example, the tolerance. If you look at Apple product, before Apple shipped their uh, iPod, roll out their iPod, it has been many years that we look at the, the products. We are getting used to in parallel lines of the plastic. Uh, uh, basically where plastic meets plastic is in peril, there's always a skill and something like that. 
And so you say, okay, how come we used to have parallel lines in those plastic, but now not anymore? Again, it's about costing down. If you cost down too much, the tolerance of your mold and everything would be lower. And you're going to be ending up having an inferior product and larger variation uh, in your pro end product. And the start, they have to, the country manufacturers have to have experiences working with startups because your demand is very different from the demand of the large uh, uh, EM, uh, the electronic companies. So they have to be open to the possibility of working with startup. Many of them don't know what startup means. So, and they have the very long-term relationship because you do not have the volume now. So some of the people say here, like, oh, but I raised more than one million on Kickstarter. I have a one million order. And let me share with you my my experience. When my when I started my uh, startup, we create we design HDMI chips. Do you know the first contract I had was Quanta. Quanta is the number two manufacturers in the world, right after Qualcomm. Do you know how big that order was? It's 500k units. 500,000 units. That's the first order I had with them. So 10k, 1k? No, it's not a big enough. You have to build a long-term relationship and persuade them that this is going to be a long-term thing. It's going to go up. Otherwise, they won't do it with you. OK, another thing I want to say that a lot of people say, we're doing manufacturing. We're going to China. We're going to everywhere. And then uh, it's what is funny that is like the entire ecosystem actually started with the Taiwan-China sort of relationship. I'm from Taiwan. And I'm going to decipher a little bit, show you some numbers. So a little bit thing about Taiwan. Taiwan started the Xinjiang Science, uh, Science and Industrial Park in 1979. In the early 80s, Taiwan was the first uh, place where we basically sort of like reinvented the idea of country manufacturing. So EMS firms are actually born out of Taiwan. You look at Acer, Asus, Quanta, and Foxconn. They're all Taiwanese companies. And in the 90s, we moved into semiconductor foundries. You all know TSMCs, the largest uh, semiconductor foundries in the world, and UMC and all those firms. And you, in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, we moved into TFT LCD manufacturers. We now have some of the largest manufacturers in the world. We have Inonox, which is under Foxconn, and AUO, which used to be Acer CM. And of course, we have the, this is where I work in for a long time. You all know MediaTek the number three uh, semiconductor uh, company in the world, and MSTAR, and Novatech, and Realtek. So if I'm just talking about names, you don't know, I'll show you the numbers. This is the ranking in 2013 of all the EMS companies in the world. Oh, so you look at the revenue there. Uh, I won't show a number here. You have the run away number one, which is Foxconn Honghai. Honghai is the mother group of Foxconn. And you look at the ranking, Honghai, Quanta, Pikachuan was the manufacturing uh, department of Asus, Flextronics, Compel, uh, Wistron was the manufacturing arm of Acer, and Jabil and Inventake. The top eight, one, two, three, five, six, eight, are all Taiwanese. They are all Taiwanese companies. The headquarters are in Taiwan, in Taipei, or in Xinjiang. They totally account for 75% of the global EMS revenue. How big that is? The global uh, EMS revenue is 367 billion. So 75% goes to Taiwanese companies. Keep that in mind. And let's talk about foundry. Number one, US TSMC run away winner. So they, they own a certain part of the uh, position. Number two, global foundries used to be with AMD. So they are the manufacturing arm of AMD and then they spin it off, spun it off and becomes global foundry. Number three, UMC, a Taiwanese company. Number six, number seven. So they totally own semiconductor foundry business of 61%. TFT LCD, a little bit. This is a bad business to be in. Don't don't join any TFT LCD manufacturers. Number one is Samsung. Number two was uh, LG. Number three was Inolux under uh, Foxconn. Number four is AUO. And the number three and number four accounts for 36 percent of the market share. IC design. Number one, Qualcomm, my previous employer. Number two, Broadcom, American company. Number three, AMD, the largest graphic chip, uh, uh, CPU and graphic chip designer, right after Intel. Number four, MediaTek, Taiwanese. Number uh, 11, 13, 16, 19. Together, they own 11% of the overall uh, IC design company. So, a little bit of a recap. Most of the EMS providers are Taiwanese. The only two big ones that you, don't, uh, that you know that are not Taiwanese are Flextronics and Jabil. Both are American. And so most of the EMS uh, uh, providers are Taiwanese, but they have their factories in Taiwan and in China, mostly in China today, but used to be in Taiwan. Most of the IC, so the PUS, and Trinity Solution modules, uh, 
basically they are from the United States and from Taiwan. So you have all those IC uh, manufacturers, IC designers that give you all the turnkey solution. And talking about turnkey solution, the kind of module you're buying, like the one that uh, uh, Steve bought from Alibaba or whatever, turnkey solutions were pioneered, was invented by MediaTek. And back in 2003 and 4 in Shenzhen, there's a huge wave of what we call Sanjai. Basically, it's uh, a couple of people that just come out and they'll just buy the module from, uh, from MediaTek and created a brand new cell phone without having to do the job themselves. So they just put on the case and do some pro software programming. Today, that, that today what we see today with maker movement that started there. It was invented by MediaTek and popularized by MSTAR and Realtek. All Taiwanese companies. Today, all the IC companies, they're providing turnkey solutions. It's just you have to do it. And today, around anywhere around 1.5 to 2 million Taiwanese work and live in China. And we only have a population of 23 million. It's a very, very close relationship. Now, China. I talk too much about Taiwan, China. There are many solutions out there, but again, if your goal is to become a dominant uh, company in your field, it's in this disputable the place to be uh, for contract manufacturing because it has the, lo the most complete supply chain and most complete logistics, and it's supported by the unique uh, Taiwan and China ecosystem. There are some things about China. It's about it's not about low cost. It's not about low cost. Okay, so it's about it's about the completeness of the, the 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 ecosystem. But I'll talk about this a little bit. And low cost doesn't mean low quality iPhone is manufactured in China. I don't think you will call iPhone low quality. So you have to scrap that. There will be low quality contract manufacturers in China, but it doesn't mean in China means definitely low cost, uh, low quality. And there are many noise in, on the market. Uh, people will say, why don't you go to uh, this place and that place? Why do you go to Shenzhen or Dongguan? Well, the only, the reality check is the only reasonable place for hardware startups. I'm talking about startups. If you're Apple, there are many choices. But if you're talking about startups, it's the only place for you to be is the Pearl River Delta region, which comprise, uh, comprising mainly Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Huizhou. And I'll show you a map. What, that, what, what does that mean? OK, so this is Hong Kong. South of China, this is Hong Kong. And on top of that, this is Shenzhen. Shenzhen is very close to Hong Kong. It was the first place who opened up when Deng Xiaoping opened the market. So that's why it's now, Shenzhen city now ranks as uh, the highest average income uh, in, in China, because they opened up the market very, very early on. And as in the past 10 years, most of the country manufacturers have already actually moved out of Shenzhen because it's getting too expensive to do there. So today, most of the country manufacturers have their factories in Dongguan, a little bit up there. So chances are when you go to Shenzhen and you visit uh, a, a, a Yuzin and they, t they, t they send the car to pick you up, it took them two hours to drive to the factory, it's probably in Dongguan. On the other side, a little bit in Zhongshan and on the upper right in Huizhou. This is the Pearl River. So there's a delta here and historically it has been a very popular, uh, very uh, prosperous place uh, in southern China. Yeah, so it's historical. The richest region of Guangdong province, which includes Hong Kong, uh, Macau, and all the uh, places that you see. So a little bit about Guangdong. This is China. So manufacturing in China, whatever, it's here. This is Guangdong, Guangdong province. And this is Taiwan. OK, and we just see the, the Delta River, uh, the uh, Yellow, uh, Pearl River Delta region is here. And this is Hong Kong. So what is Guangdong? Guangdong and Canton uh, basically are the same thing. In the, in, the, in the Guangdong province, the Cantonese, they speak Cantonese. They don't speak Mandarin. So it's, today, if you go to Shenzhen, there will be people speaking Mandarin because, because of TV or radio. Uh, it gets more popular. But if you go to certain places, they only speak Cantonese. Uh, this province has 106 million people. 106 million people. In China, everything is much bigger <laughs> in terms of number. 106 million people. Most of them speak Cantonese. And uh, uh, if you go to any place, Chinatown. OK, I'll skip to the, uh, this one is interesting. Everybody talks about Foxconn, OK? Foxconn was founded, uh, it's owned by the Hong Hai Group, and it's founded by Terry Guo, a Taiwanese. And these are the places where they have offices or factories, OK? The revenue of 2014 is 115 billion US dollars. And anyone care to guess what's the gross margin they have? Any idea? 
gross margin. They, they call last year a good year. So last year is a good year for them, 7%. 7%. What's the net, net margin? So the net profit. Good year, 4%. On a good year, you get 4% of 115 billion into your, and what's their market cap? Market, you know market cap, the, the, the value of their stocks? 45 billion. Do you know the market cap of Facebook? Last year, right now, the market of Facebook right now is 200 and I think 20 billion on a 15 billion revenue. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that this is a volume business. Very low margin, huge volume. I don't care if you're a people, what if people right now manufacture is Foxconn, but you're not going to get them until you have the volume. It's a volume business. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're sleeping with the granddaughter of uh, Terry Gore or not. Doesn't work. Okay, so I, I'll skip the Indian part because maybe you've never heard about it. Okay, so again, Delta River, uh, uh, Pearl River Delta is still without a doubt a top choice of Huawei startups. And the last slide is, if we, because in Huawei Club we work with all kinds of uh, EMS manufacturers, we work with the giant, we build relationship with Foxconn, Quanta, Pegatron, and Flexronics, not Compel, but we strong Jabil and Inventech. And we also work with the middle one. So the revenue is around 0.5 for 500 million to 3 billion, this type. And overall, their capability and quality are actually as good as the, what we call the elephants, the giants. But uh, basically, just have lower volume than those people. And then in the middle, you have the smaller ones, 15 to, 15 to 50 million. These are the, so this, there are many firms that have this kind of revenue, so it's not classified by revenues, but I'm just telling you the kind of country manufacturers that you're be going to be working with. This would be a class, I call them the layer parts. They move very fast. They're experts in a certain domain, and they're in Shenzhen and Dongguan, and they're funded by people who were formerly with, work with the elephants or the lions. And so in those three people, Okay, you can talk about uh, whatever you want. In those three people, the most likely and the most useful manufacturers for you in your first batch will be these people. It's not gonna be the giants, it's not, it's not gonna happen. It might happen with this, if your product is so interesting and you have the proper channel to basically connect you to those people, but it will take them a little bit time to figure out whether it's worth working with you. With those people, you talk to the president and the next day, it's on. So everything is going, okay. So this is a half of a very long presentation. We have a lot more data and not, not more thing we can talk about, but given the time constraint, I'll just stop here. Is there any question on the floor or? Okay, uh, yeah. Even if you get in touch with them, they probably won't talk to you. Yeah, so uh, you see the Huawei Club label there? <laughs> yeah, so in Huawei Club, we try to help, we help our startups uh, to scale. We are the scaling platform for them. And for all of those uh, companies, I personally build a relationship with them. I visited them, I visited the, the factories, they went through referrals, qualified them. I already dropped some of them that, that are not qualified. So for Huawei Club startups, we basically connect you. And we actually, it depends on your product, we refer you to the proper uh, country manufacturer that will save you the most time. And, and, but it's really about long-term relationship. Yeah, everything, yeah. If you're, if you're, I mean, environmental cost in China, or, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you'll see the, uh, you'll see all kinds of news and, and there. Well, the reality is, if you do it in Dongguan, if you have ever been to Dongguan, you'll see that the sky is always gray, and and people living there will tell you that they have never seen that the sky is blue. There was one time there was sky was blue. The guy told me that I actually took a lot of pictures because that's the only time we have this blue sky. It's as many, power, many parts of China has reached the point of no return. So there's almost nothing you can do to revert the, the, the harm they cause on, on, on the environment. So if you're an absolute uh, like green is like Green Party, uh, uh, you probably have to find other solution. I, I don't know such, if such solution existed. The, the kind of price point that you get used to today it's entirely driven by this Chinese ecosystem. So if you think, oh, a smartwatch should cost no, no, no more than 200, if you have that mental mark, it's driven by that system. Now you look at uh, Foxconn. 
such successful company, such a big company, the gross margin is 7%. So there's no fixing of it. I mean, it's different standard, right? I mean, here in Paris, as in last year, they issue a air pollution warning. And, and I look at the sky, okay, this is pretty clean, actually. <laughs> Why are you limiting my car to go on the road? But, but if you go to Beijing, that's like the, uh, um, the, the cleanest day in Beijing is probably 10 times or 100 times worse than the worst day in, in Paris. And, and it's already, it's really a problem. I mean, even the Beijing people, they're talking about how to fix it, but it cannot be fixed. And so if you're building a startup, you know, try to be nice, but there's no uh, way to get around uh, that implicit, if that's your yeah, main concern. Yeah. I have, uh, I worked in Taiwan for 10 years. I work in Science Park. I build a startup that sells chips to country manufacturers and clients. I have my own networks, and the network is growing. So it's all through referrals. So people, friends of friends, and they will refer me. I'll go check them, OTT them, sit down, having a tea, cup of tea, figure out what they can do. And, and it's a lot of like soft aspects. You can get a list, but it's not going to work. You need to know people that know the people. I'm sorry? Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're ready for manufacturing, well, again, it depends on your purpose. If your purpose to get, go to China is to find someone who can quickly produce the thing for you, and you ship it out, and that's it, then that's a different story. But if your purpose is that I'm going to build the next Oculus VR, or I'm going to build the next uh, Pebble and become a, a unicorn, what we call a unicorn in VC term, uh, one billion dollar valuation company, then you have to be very diligent and you have to choose the right people to work with, the right investors, the right uh, kind of people that can help you. Uh, as to when to go, I mean, if you're thinking about those questions already, you're talking to people that can help you decide when to go. But you cannot just buy a ticket and go there. It's, it's, it's a different story. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. You can switch.